I'd just stay here, and that's the future for you. So, um, and in Canton, uh, like most small towns, the armory was absolutely in the center of town and, and was absolutely uh, really one of the high points of where I grew up. Very, very small farming town. So small, my dad was my high school principal and my mother was my fourth grade teacher. Um, but the National Guard played a prominent role uh, as I was growing up, and that's really my only exposure uh, to the military before I came in. So thank you very much. Uh, this invitation came in, and, and this is one I could not afford to not attend because this is such a critical gathering, not only for the United States Army, but really for the Joint Force. And so thank you, thank you for having me here today. I've, I, mean, I couldn't be more thrilled. And before I start, uh, of course, I would just express my thoughts, prayers, and support for our brothers and sisters on the southeast border as Dorian continues to waver and, and try to make up his mind on what it's going to do. Uh, my thanks for the Texas Guard, because I'm now in Austin, Texas, is the headquarters of Army Futures Command. Uh, Tracy Norris and I kind of share Camp Mabry. I like that she doesn't, but that's okay. Um, and the headquarters is in downtown Austin. And then, of course, I got lots of good friends. I don't know if Kendall Penn is here from the great state of Arkansas or not, but Kendall was one of my battalion commanders uh, in OIF2. Tim Gowan, if Tim's here, I think he is now dual-hatted because I think he's officially the tag in Maryland today, and he's also my DCG. Uh, so it's almost like a homecoming. So thanks again for having me here today. Army Futures Command is about a year old. Uh, Last July, we had 13 people. Uh, right now, I've got a little over 25,000. So over the last year, it's been a startup trying to manage a merger. But I declared fully operational uh, on 31 July. And I'll talk to you a little bit about the reasons behind Army Futures Command and really what we're trying to do in Austin, Texas. And I think I've got 30, 35 minutes, and I will save some time at the end for, for questions. And if I can get my first slide, please. Do I have slides? They are behind me. I was, I was thinking I was going to be able to see them down here so I don't have to turn around all the time. So, next slide. All right, they're there. Okay, so a couple of things on this slide I think that is important to part out or point out. One of the things we're trying to establish as an army, as part of the Joint Force, is this concept of perpetual or persistent modernization. And the Army, over the last 18 years, just like the Joint Force, has been very focused on coin operations in both Iraq and Afghanistan. And we have fundamentally missed an entire generation of modernization uh, from a materiel standpoint and really from a concept and doctrinal evolution. And the, the concept of perpetual modernization is really so we don't go through this very same thing 30 years from now. So how do you change the mindset especially given the pace of technolo technology and the pace of innovation that we become a perpetually or persistently modernizing organization. The other key thing in this statement is the unity of effort piece, and that's really the reason uh, the chief, then General Milley, and the secretary, then Secretary Esper, stood up Army Futures Command, is that the modernization responsibilities for the United States Army was really spread out across uh, several ACOMs, across the Army staff, and really only came together at the Secretary and Chief level. And the Secretaries and Chiefs tend to be very intelligent people, but when you're trying to synchronize and make sausage at their level, it just doesn't really work very well. So one single command focused on modernization across the entire enterprise. And then, obviously, the Joint Force, I've mentioned that, with a focus, and if General McConville was here yesterday, I'm sure he said winning matters with a focus on winning in a future conflict. Deterring, if at all possible, and when necessary, focus on winning. Next slide. So the world has changed, and that's really what the Army realized uh, probably about five or six years ago. At that point, I was the Army G8, and I think I testified at least four or five times in front of Congress and said that, that the Army was in an inflection point, that we had to begin modernization, but back then, the money was not sufficient to maintain and build readiness and modernize at the same time. The one thing that's happened is, knock on wood, here pretty soon we'll have four years of stable and predictable funding if the, if the budget passes. And we have leadership committed to modernization. And although Secretary McCarthy has recently talked about the Army will continue to have to find money I do believe that we have sufficient funds to both sustain and build the readiness towards the FY22 readiness goals across all three compos and begin a very serious modernization given 
the, real, the realignment of some of the resources within the Army's budget. Uh, the other thing that's changed is the challenge of the rules-based international order. Simply stated, uh, Ukraine in the Donbass, Crimea, and what you see going on in South China Sea right now in terms of the challenges to what we had considered coming out of World War II to be a rules-based international order, really working to the benefit of not only the United States, but really our key allies and partners. And then this shifting balance of economic power from the Atlantic-based economies to the Pacific-based economies. Coupled with that second bullet is the changing character of war. And if you've been listening over the last four and a half years, General Milley has talked about this extensively. And it's really changing character of war based upon the emerging technologies that you see uh, listed there. And it really may not be any one of those specific technologies. It may be more so a combination of technologies. And, and the, the nation that determines how to combine those technologies in a unique manner uh, will most likely have a significant benefit, benefit in the next first battle, much like just prior to World War II, every nation had tanks, every nation had airplanes, and every nation had radios, but only the Germans uh, figured out how to combine them in a very unique way that enabled the concept called Blitzkrieg that gave them a significant advantage early in World War II. And then out of all of those, um, all of those to include artificial intelligence, which is also always a debate, are coming to a battlefield of the future. In my mind, it's not a question of if, it's just a question of when. And there is a debate going on in the country right now in terms of ethical use of some of these technologies, uh, but that debate's not going on in other places in the world. So I do believe that we have to capitalize on American industry, really the innovation and the knowledge that I see each and every day across this country and, and really start to focus on not only incorporating these technologies, but also capitalizing on the rate of innovation that's going on in the commercial sector. So how do you take advantage of something that fundamentally changes from a technology standpoint every two or three years and make sure you can roll them into a program that's probably going to be in the United States Army for 30 or 40 years. Next slide. And we've been here before. Uh, you recognize Don Starry. Uh, back in the late 70s, early 80s, we went through a generation, uh, generational change coming out of Vietnam, much like we're coming out of counterinsurgency or ops today. Uh, where we went through a doctrine develop concept development first and then doctrine development uh, called Airland Battle and we went through a developmental programs or programs called the Big Five. The Big Five really were about 60 programs that came along with the Big Five and then the evolution of uh, what was first called active defense into Airland Battle and that process started fundamentally in about 1967 and wrapped up in about 1986. So people ask me all the time, where are you today? I would say we're probably about 1978 or 1979s in terms of our evolution with the, with the Army's uh, big six uh, priorities in terms of capabilities and then what, I, what is called multi-domain operations, which is a concept uh, today, and that concept is, continues to be refined and will be turned into airland battle at some point, it will probably be over the next two to three years. Next slide. And important point. Concepts drive change, and so general order that established Army Futures Command really tasked me with four fundamental things. One was to look into the future and establish, or at least establish, a, a conceptual basis for what the future operational environment will look like. When I say future, right now we're focused on the time frame of between uh, 28 and 35. And there's really nothing special about those years except for it gives you a target to look into the future and try to establish. Looking out that far, let's say 2035, we know we will be wrong. And that's okay. Uh, we just have to be more right than we are wrong. And it gives us a point of reference in the future to look out to. And, and the one thing that reinforced to me more and more every day is everything of value. Uh, I've learned in the Army, I learned at Ranger School. And one of the lessons they, they teach you is, is set your objective first, start planning against the objective because it's the most important thing and then work your way back. And so that future focus of what that operational environment looks like, will it be dense urban combat? Who are the likely near peer competitors in that time frame? Figuring out what that looks like, knowing we're gonna be wrong, leaving enough room uh, to, on, the, on that journey to get there that we can, we can make changes as necessary. And then once you've kind of figured that out, 
what organizational structure does the Army need to have to operate in that environment? What fundamental changes do we need to make from an institutional standpoint? Uh, how we organize the Army? Is it modularity going into the future or is it something different? Do we need to put, for instance, we just had this conversation, reconnaissance back into the division and corps. Do we need, what, what impact will robotics have on organizational structures going forward? So operational environment, how we organize, and then next would be what concepts do we need to fight in that operational environment with those organizational structures. So that's the concepts piece of it, and that's why concepts are driving change. And once you have those three things, that concept becomes the foundation for what capabilities you need to build for the future. And that's what's fundamentally changed in the Army. The Army for the last 15 or 16 really more than that. Probably I would argue since the Berlin Wall, Berlin Wall fell has been a capabilities fo focused developmental organization. We develop capabilities because of the capability as opposed to developing a capability based upon a need in the operating operational concept the Army intended to fight with. And so what you'll find is when you look at the big six and the 31 things the cross-functional teams are working on, they are grounded in this concept called multi-domain operations. And that makes it actually much, much easier when I go to the appropriation staff in particular and argue for money against the capability is you can ground it against a specific enemy uh, on a specific piece of terrain to do a specific thing uh, on that concept to enable uh, that concept. Next slide. I mentioned the six modernization priorities, the eight cross-functional teams, uh, and you can see the modernization priorities. There's 31 or so things that are working. Uh, I have resisted over the last year adding to those 31, although we have added a couple things uh, because I'm worried about uh, a loss of focus. The things that make these modernization priorities is they are not the chief's priorities, they're not the secretary's priorities, they are the Army's priorities. Uh, the regular Army, the National Guard, and the U.S. Army Reserve. And you have leadership, although you have seen significant change of leadership at the top of the Army, there's also significant continuity when it comes to what the Army is trying to accomplish in terms of its modernization priorities. Uh, General McConville was here yesterday. He obviously was the Vice Chief of Staff. Those are remain the Army's six modernization priorities, even with the change of the Chief of Staff. Secretary McCarthy's, I think his, his confirmation hearing is the 12th. Um, if he becomes the Secretary of the Army, those will be the six Army modernization priorities uh, for the rest of the time that, that Secretary uh, McCarthy is there. And with Joe Martin and now as the Vice and, and the, the person performing the duties, the Under Secretary of the Army, that's a mouthful, um, the official performing, those remain the Army's six modernization priorities. There is buy-in across all the four stars across the Army, that those are the modernization priorities, and we're getting buy-in across the entire Army, uh, and I think Dan Hokinson would agree, uh, across the entire Army, that that is what the Army is focused on. Those are the priorities that we shifted uh, just north of $30 billion within the program over the last couple of years to make sure that those, those 31 things, uh, under long-range range precision fires, for instance, uh, the PRISM missile, uh, we will, we will demonstrate within the next 18 to 24 months north of 500 kilometers. And the only reason it's gonna take that long is we gotta get, uh, we got range restrictions on the first test flights on the ATAC and replacement. Two per pod as opposed to one, so you're doubling your load out. Hypersonics is under a different organization, but hypersonics missiles, uh, 2,500 kilometers. Uh, the IRCA, uh, the next generation howitzer, we've already fired that 70, 70 plus kilometers doubling the range. And that's just one of the examples working on. That's where the $30 billion went um, against those modernization priorities. Uh, next gen combat vehicles, I think you're tracking future vertical lift, two new vertical lift platforms. ap and I'll mention ap and 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 most everybody knows what that means. That's also where space resides for the Army. Um, we had pursued a LEO constellation uh, really to do a lot of things for us to include imaging, uh, GPS, and, or GPS replacement and communications. Just recently inked a deal with the NRO that the NRO is going to provide 
tactical level commanders direct tasking authorities over low earth satellites and when i say tactical edge i mean that matters what you define tactical edge to the bct level direct tasking over over overhead reconnaissance assets which has never been done before uh, of course tying us all together is the network air missile defense new patriot radar bought two batteries of iron dome to figure out the next generation of indirect fire protection Mobile shore ad will deliver uh, the first mobile shore ad, which is a striker with Hellfire missile and Stinger missile uh, to the BCTs within about two years of the demand signal. Soldier lethality will deliver the next generation night vision goggles to the uh, second brigade of first ID. 19 months demand signal uh, delivered to the first unit. Uh, and then synthetic training environment, which is in Orlando, uh, and they're hunkered down right now. But the, the, and it's really the incorporation of all these things. And then really from an AFC standpoint, what we're focused on, which the Army never really has done a good job of, is how does this all work together? What's, what's the mission engineering or the systems of systems engineering that enables all these things to work together uh, as part of the joint force going into the future? Next slide. And then... One of the things that I'm very, very proud of, a couple of things I'm very, very proud of, it, it, and one is the cross-functional teams, which was not my idea, but I'm now so sold on this. And the most powerful thing we're finding with the cross-functional teams is this marriage at the top of each one of these cross-functional teams with a CFT director, uh, a former brigade commander. Um, in all cases, as soon as I get one promoted, uh, general officers, uh, and minus one's an SES two. Uh, and with a senior program manager, in, in many cases, a program executive officer, sitting around the same table in the same location, 24 hours a day, trying to solve the same problems against that concept. And that interaction and that really marriage at the top of a, of a very experienced uh, operator and a very experienced and professional acquisition professional is what is really moving these programs along. We have, we have gone from a three to five year requirements process to in most cases, in all cases, less than six months to get a requirements document uh, written and approved by Army senior leadership. 804 authorities, 806 authorities are really helping our acquisition community shorten the timeline it takes us to get into acquisition. We are focused on prototyping and experimentation prior to writing an official requirements document. So we know what is possible from a technology standpoint and we are incorporating soldiers across really all of the compos. And this is, and I, I've not explored this to as much as I should, but there are National Guard armories every place across this country. And I really believe that we could incorporate National Guard soldiers uh, into this and get the same feedback I'm getting from regular Army soldiers right now because uh, Force Comm's busy uh, and Force Comm has bent over backwards to support us. So one of the outreaches that I wanna do here is reach out to uh, the TAGs and if we can get your soldiers involved in this soldier feedback because the feedback we're getting early, often and throughout the process is just fundamentally changing the way we're doing acquisition. I was just out in Redmond, Washington uh, last week, and there's a project going on out there with Microsoft called IVAS. And so there's, there's lots of strange things going on. The Army's partner with Microsoft. Um, the Army is doing agile development of what will be, I'm positive, a 10X capability, and it's fundamentally, in simplest terms, a heads-up display for a ground soldier that gives you all the information uh, that any other heads-up display would give you. We will eventually, after we deliver that, expand that into our ground combat fleet to where you become, um, and the concept is invisible armor. So based on placement of cameras around the outside of the vehicle, sitting inside a combat vehicle looks just like you're sitting with none of the armor around you. That will be incorporated, I'm convinced, into our aviation fleet at some point in the future for the same concept. Targeting in the HUD uh, to include the weapon site that you'll carry on your individual weapon so you can physically shoot around corners without ever sp exposing yourself around corners. You just stick the weapon out there and you can see through the, the weapon site. Um, Blue Force Tracker in the heads-up display. Digital compass inside the display. Terrain data down to about three meter resolution any place in the world inside the heads-up display. And the incorporation 
with synthetic training, uh, the ability for a squad leader to very quickly generate a scenario and run his squad through it. So you get a thousand hits at the sled before you play your first game. Uh, so just 10 X capability that's being done with Microsoft with soldiers from Fort Lewis, from the Ranger Regiment, from the, the, the Special Forces group out there and from i -Corps, and it's being done in three week sprints where they're getting soldier feedback every three weeks and developers are turning that very, very quickly. Um, and the progress they've made in just nine months is just phenomenal and it's different than the way we've ever done it before and it, there is no reason why we can't apply those lessons learned across our acquisition community. Uh, next slide. And this is just some of the, the feedback we get uh, from those soldier touch points. And, and it's, it, it is, we're working with Texas A&M right now. And, and of course, if I'm working with Texas A&M, you must realize I'm also work, working with the University of Texas. The, um, the and, and most of you have time on the Hill and, and the, the, the politics between universities is just amazing. Uh, it is, I'd rather be on, in, in across the river uh, on Capitol Hill than sometimes dealing with the politics between and amongst universities. Um, but we're working with Texas A&M right now and the state of Texas, between A&M and Texas has invested $135 million to build us a prototyping facility uh, where we can take soldiers, and I really don't care if they come from Fort Hood or the 36th ID or Arkansas, or for that matter, Maine, if you wanna get down to, to Texas A&M and put them against developing capability to get this type of feedback. Next slide. And then abnormal, this is my last slide. So different command, so different vision. And I came up with this because I have uh, now eight grandchildren ranging in age from 14 to four months. Um, one of them is soon to turn four. Uh, her name is Lauren and out of all eight of them, uh, there is absolutely zero doubt in my mind that 25 years from now, Lauren will be wearing a Ranger tab commanding an airborne infantry company. Um, <laughs> and so that's, that's why it's personal to me. And that's why I think it should be personal to anybody wearing a uniform uh, because this has become, like it or not, a family business. Um, I have three daughters, all three of them married soldiers. I'm sure that if you have uh, children, uh, a majority of you have children that, that are part of one of the branches of the military. There's no doubt in my mind, my, some of my grandchildren will one part, or at one point be part of the military. So that's, that's why it's personal to me and that's why I think it's, it's about developing not just the capability, but the structures, the concepts and the capabilities that knock on wood and hopefully the vindication of everything that we are doing at Army Futures Command is those future kids will never have to use that capability in a near peer fight. That nobody would ever take on the United States in ground combat as part of the US Joint Force. But if they do, we give them the ability to bring every, each and every one of their soldiers home after a decisive win. So with that, I'm happy to stop there and take some of your questions. Morning, sir. Lieutenant Colonel Mike Booker, Virginia Army National Guard. Uh, that was pretty weak. Well, that's pretty weak. Let's hear it for Virginia I know, again. Yeah. <laughs> I hope that's not just about me. But, um, <laughs> I'm currently a student at the uh, War College in Carlisle, and we're ironically studying everything you just talked about right now. I have a paper due on the 22nd, and <laughs> I was wondering if you could give me a hand. Uh, my question is uh, what would you say is the number one most dangerous technology uh, being developed by our adversaries that is a future threat to the U.S. Army? I, I, I will give you better than that. So it, it's specifically China and it's the moonshot they have going on right now in terms of artificial intelligence. Um, so, um, and, and people talk about AI all the time and, 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 and I'm no expert, but after really talking to people for about a year, as most people don't understand what they're talking about when they talk about artificial intelligence. So when I, when I talk to people with uh, not such good haircuts and not such good dress codes, 
they immediately think I'm talking about Terminator, that the Army is after building the Terminator. And, and there's, there's so many applications short of that. I fundamentally think, and, and I'm, not, I'm not an offset person, so I'm not going to call this the fourth or fifth or sixth offset, or whatever it is, but the nation that develops the capability on a battlefield to understand first and act first uh, will be at a significant, I just, the, the future battlefield, you know, if you ask me what 2035 looks like, incredibly lethal, incredibly chaotic. The amount of information available to a commander is going to grow a hundredfold. So how do you sort through and in, in, in the attempts to deceive commanders uh, in the information space is going to grow a hundredfold. So how do you sort through all that, really the, the science of command and enable a, a, a future commander to really uh, exercise the art of command and make it within, make decisions within terms you're familiar with the OODA loop of whatever opponent they have in terms of that decision making. I really think that, so artificial intelligence that way, um, there's no reason artificial intelligence can't do airspace deconfliction force, uh, which is gets inside that OODA loop. So there's just so many things AI can enable. I do think that is probably the thing that's going to be most important. Thank you, sir. I have permission to quote you on that? Sure. Thank you. And if they challenge you on that, tell them give me a call. <laughs> yes, sir. Good morning, sir. Colonel Terry Hashey, Florida Army National Guard. You shouldn't be here. I've got, I've got a place in Florida. You need to get down to Florida. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I'll be leaving now. <laughs> sir, I'm a traditional guardsman, and I'm a small business owner, I'm a family physician, and I'm a taxpayer. And I appreciate your vision and your execution of that vision. One of my concerns is, as we heard yesterday from General Langell, that we don't want hand-me-down equipment from active component because we're an operational reserve. What do we do with the equipment that we're buying at such a rapid pace in the future to not let it fall into the hands of our enemies, but we, we've already bought this equipment? You talking about the legacy equipment? No, sir. When you say fall into the hands of enemies, I'm so... Let me, let, me take it, let me take it this way, and then you tell me if I didn't hit everything you want to talk about. So um, the hand-me-down equipment, I'm going to take it that way first. And so I am pushing, and I have been pushing since I was a G8, that, you know, if you look at um, next-generation combat vehicle, uh, first, first iteration of it will be what we're calling optionally manned fighting vehicle. Think Bradley replacement is the first combat vehicle replacing. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do five brigades of A4s to get the last of the ODSs out of the inventory. And then we'll start fielding uh, the Bradley replacement about 25 or 26. Even, on, even if budgets stay where they are for the next 30 years, which they won't, um, even if we retain uh, buying power against inflation for the next 30 years, which we won't, it would take me 20 years to replace every Bradley across the United States Army, because we've got um, a number of Armored Brigade combat teams, both in Compo 1 and Compo 2. And then we've got uh, APS throughout the world, the, the pre-position stocks. So in that 20 years, we're going to have to make decisions on who gets fielded first. And that that's, comes back to this, where you can tie this into uh, near-peer pacing threats. And so I have been an advocate for a long time, and I continue to advocate, is that we field contact and blunt layers in the two theaters um, and surge forces identified for the two theaters first, regardless of compo, prior, you know, before anybody else gets it. Now that, people says that smacks of an ALO army, and I grew up in an ALO army. I was an ALO 4 unit when I was a company commander. You know, my friends and, and my peers were had Abrams and Bradley and in Europe. I had uh, M68-3s and, and 113s as a company commander at Fort Carson. Um, and it was a damn good unit. And that was obviously a regular Army unit. So I think we got to focus on the requirements of the op plans that we're supporting. And we're, you'll hear, start hearing a concept called Force Package 1. So what's the first force package that has to go? And that is a mixed compo force package to me the newest and best equipment goes to force package one, and then we'll continue. Because you're going to have to make those fielding decisions regardless of what the rationale is. The problem is for the last 18 years, it's been based upon the next brigade that's going to rotate in the theater. 
um, and it's, it's, it's a never-ending never cycle. And it's almost back to an old concept that I'm very familiar with called Forces 4. So there, each of the op plans, each of the, the COCOMs, there was a Forces 4 document that clearly identified the units that would support that op plan, and you fielded them first, uh, the best equipment we could possibly field. Did I answer Did I answer it? Yes, sir. I was, I was specifically asking about what you do with the, the night vision goggles, the weapon systems at the user level that right. we're buying every two years. Um, so the... Right now, and I just, I had this number last week, the number is something like um, 300,000 pairs of PVS 14s and PVS 7s. So I think what you're referring to is this concept of this close combat 100,000, uh, which once again is both COMPO 1 and COMPO 2. And that's for IVAS. Um, and then right now we're fielding the enhanced night vision binocular uh, to, to the infantry BCT. That will be replaced uh, with IVAS when we start fielding that. EMBGBs will roll down across all COMPOs to other than the close combat 100,000. And then we're going to have to replace the 7s and 14s. So I think we'll continue to, and, and if you're still using a PBS 7, it's non-repairable. It breaks. We just throw them away. So we'll continue to replace those with, uh, with the binocular probably and then potentially IVAS based upon some future decisions. Thank you, sir. Yep. Morning, sir. I'm uh, First Lieutenant Tyler Cope with the Kentucky Army National Guard. <clears throat> I'm currently a uh, company commander, and I was curious if you had any uh, advice or thoughts on uh, how we balance the dichotomy of training for the future uh, near peer threat and our current op tempo in the Middle East. Yeah, the, uh, the problem is that we're done with the Middle East, but the Middle East is not done with us. Um, you probably heard that someplace else. Um, I mean, the, the national defense strategy is pretty quick. We, we have we have got to reduce demand. You know, and then the Army's talking about a change in priority in FY22 from readiness to modernization. I, 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 for the last year or two, and still struggle with trying to figure out exactly what that means because it's cost us a certain amount of money to reach that readiness level. It's, I don't think the money's gonna go down to sustain that readiness level. Um, and so what that fundamentally means will work out in 22 in terms of a shift. I don't think it's a shift in money uh, especially since the Army continues to grow uh, at a very moderate pace right now. And, and I mentioned the budget, so I, I do think we're going to be flat in the out years is, is all, everybody's expectation. So we'll figure out how we continue to modernize, and it may be more shifting around of, of money within the Army's budget, uh, which I think is still possible, but we have, we have basically gotten all the low-hanging fruit out of the budget. I do think that we're going to have to we're going to have to reduce the op tempo um, on the joint force at, at some point in the future. And if you're asking me for a good idea about how to do that, um, you should probably ask McConville that. But the I, I don't know uh, because it's all based upon demand from the combatant commanders, and it's all going to come down to where do you want to accept some risk. Uh, so do you want to accept risk in the in the readiness levels with the getting back to high intensity conflict, or do you want to uh, accept some risk in your preparations for high intensity combat and support the, the missions, the smaller missions in the Middle East. I, and the Army's, uh, we're, you know, we're standing up more of the SFABs, so I think we got three now, and I think number three is in Afghanistan. Number one, I think, is going to, to Africa, support AFRICOM. And so those advise and assist missions, we are standing up some structure, which the Army resisted for a long, long, long time doing that. Um, and part of that is also so we don't learn, lose the lessons from Iraq and Afghanistan, which we completely wished that away when we came out of Vietnam. And that's in the next generation doctrine, uh, we can't afford to lose those lessons that we've learned very painfully over the last 18 years. And then I think the structure will help a little bit, but it's fundamentally going to be come down to where you want to take some risk. Thank you, sir. Good morning, sir. CW3 Dan Fish from Michigan National Guard. Uh, OH. <laughs> you know, the, Michi the, the Michigan State, uh, Michigan, Ohio State thing, I was going to try to leave that off the table, but... Um, Gun Army next week, brother. <laughs> <sighs> so anyway, sir, yes. Um, <laughs> two questions, two, two questions. One, sir, uh, uh, on the outside, so currently I work uh, in the G3 in leader development down at uh, uh, Guard Bureau, uh, but I'm also a 915 automotive guy, but on the outside I work for DLA Disposition Services. And so to the disposal question uh, from the good colonel there, 
uh, all those PBS 14s, uh, everything that we're disposing of, everything that's at Sierra, everything we want to try to refit, DLA Disposition Services is reutilizing, disposing of properly, and ensuring national security. Uh, specifically, I work in DMIL Policy Office, so we use the 4160, a bunch of the ODI instructions. There's a number of things out there that we do to ensure our other NATO partners receive our equipment, like Jordan, for instance. We, uh, we, we give them a lot of equipment. We do a lot of cross-loving of that property. So uh, from, from a fiscal taxpayer perspective, that does occur. Um, and then everything else, for in PBS-14s, we actually have to put them in a plastic bag and hammer them away, and, and there's some uh, other, other waste that occurs. So uh, there's a lot of things that go on that, with that. Uh, my other question, sir, is in terms of acquisition, how is DLA postured and how are they helping and are they helping uh, as we move forward with futures? It's something that's very important to all of us. The, um, so I'll I tell you, to and I, and I, be honest, Chief, we don't work too much directly with General Williams and DLA, um, but, you know, it does bring up a great point I didn't talk about is, is the, the general order that I've referenced gives me responsibility across the entire acquisition cycle, if you will, everything from a, a good idea to disposal. Um, and so from the disposal piece, you know, directly to, to your last point is I am the, believe it or not, the ultimate decider on what equipment gets disposed of because bringing in new equipment is, is good. Uh, but if you bring in new equipment and keeping all the old, that sustainment cost just, it just continues to go up and you eat up more and more of your budget. So divesting is as important as investing. And so Dr. Jetty, the Army Acquisition Executive, and General Perna at AMC really tee up. Um, and then the final arbitrator is me to decide. And we've got, I think when I get back uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, we got teed up with about 400 pieces of equipment that will go into sustainment and, and then eventual divestiture. Um, but, you know, from a, the partnership across what we call the Future Force Modernization Enterprise, and if, if you really think about it, the Future Force Modernization Enterprise is the entire Army. But if you narrow that down a little bit further, it's really this partnership, not only at the, the CFT director and the PM level, but the Army Acquisition Executive, Dr. Bruce Jetty, and me, uh, to where I am very comfortable with him coming in in the requirements process and questioning from a technology standpoint as the Army's chief science scientist, you know, is that really the requirement? And, and then what it's, and then from an ANC standpoint, looking at it from a sustainment standpoint, and then from our cyber standpoint, looking at it the cyber vulnerability standpoint. And so it's this community of interest before we ever formalize a requirements document um, based upon all those partnerships. And then once we make a decision, ACC, the Army Contracting Command, those 31 things are absolutely their top priorities. And so we're moving very, very quickly from an ACC standpoint as well. Thank you, sir. Go blue. <laughs> we have time for one more. I'll let you get away with that one. one more. All I can say is six in a row. Uh, speaking of gold. <laughs> <laughs> speaking of go blue, go Air Force. No. Uh, uh, good morning, sir. Brigadier General Mookie Walker, West by God, Virginia. Uh, that's right. So uh, I'd like to ask, how is the Air Force working with Futures Command to ensure synchronization in the joint fight, particularly in intra-theater airlift and uh, future battlefield command and control? That's a, I mean, that's a great way to end this. And so um, from a material standpoint, not so much as you would imagine. I mean, I really don't want anything to do with the F-35, and they're really not interested in next-gen squad weapon. Um, but from a concept standpoint, the Air Force has stood up an organization called AFWIC uh, that is working within the A-5 right now, and there's some talk within the Air Force of, of separating that and making its own potentially a MAGCOM. Um, and uh, Fan Man, uh, I forget, that's his call sign. I've forgotten, actually, you guys use all these call signs. I've memorized that, and I've forgotten names. It's, it's worked with us very, very closely, and, and, and General Holmes, Mobile Holmes, um, has been down to Austin several times from ACC. And so from a concept standpoint, the, I think the Air Force and the Army is probably closer than we have been conceptually uh, since the 31 initiatives kind of, you know, COIN kind of got in the way of the 31 initiatives that were part of the airland battle effort, or airland battle effort uh, back in the early 80s. 
Um, and, the Berlin, and like I said, the Berlin Wall fell down and really lost a lot of emphasis. Um, what's the Navy less so, the Marine Corps is kind of, you know, toeing the line between the Navy and the ground forces, seeing which way this is all going to work out. But really across all four services, we, we ran a war game at Leavenworth, it's been probably two months ago, South China Sea, which is, believe it or not, the first time we've modeled the South China Sea in a really serious way. We had a, we had a three-star Navy Admiral. Uh, we had a, uh, two Air Force General Officers. Fan Man was there in Q. Um, I forgot, like, I've forgotten his name, too. Um, from the Air Staff, uh, we had a one-star Marine there. And then a, the Under Secretary of the Army and the Chief of Staff of the Army took the out brief. Uh, so what's really missing and is coming this fall is the overarching joint concept. So we, you know, and I really think this is one of the unintended consequences of when we stood down Joint Forces Command is, and this is nobody's fault. Uh, the assumption when we stood down Joint Forces Command was the J-7 could, could absorb the, the work that was going on down in Suffolk. It was just a really bad assumption. And so a really well thought out, modeled, joint operational concept for the services to nest under, I think is one of the things that's missing. The joint, this current Joint Staff J-7 is driving that. Up in Newport this fall, there's going to be a, a joint staff war game to start to flesh out the joint concept. I think that's, that is a key enabler. And then you mentioned the, uh, the C2 piece of it, if you will. The Air Force has, uh, they used to call it multi-demand command and control, and they've changed the name now, and I can't remember what they've called it, but uh, they are really focused on uh, any sensor, any shooter. If you boil that concept right down to bare bones, it's any sensor, any shooter. We agree 100%, we're just not sure everything needs to go through the AOC. And other than that fundamental disagreement, that's about the only disagreement we've got with the Air Force in terms of concepts. So I, I am very encouraged on where we are with the Air Force right now. And we'll have to continue to, to modify, right? So it's a democracy. Uh, we're gonna end up doing what everybody agrees to do. Um, and so I'm not convinced the concept we have right now is 100% right. Uh, but the dialogue is ongoing and, they're, and, and we're working very, very closely together. So I'm very encouraged. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.